So good afternoon, everybody. Oh, it's another afternoon that we're together and there is a lot to learn today. That's because we're going to be talking about interior design, impact of COVID-19. We all know this lockdown is going to change the world in very many ways and interior space also definitely will be impacted. And we are going to talk to Madhav Raman, our designer for the day. Uh, just before that, let me quickly uh, tell you about myself. My name is Nain Xiao, and I am with GS Institute of Design. I have many, many years, more than two decades of uh, work experience in education, in design education. Um, besides that, I have the opportunity to, of course, meet up many bright designers, Mother being one of them. So uh, today I brought him here to talk to us and to know his views on what he thinks the impact will be like. Of course, a lot of this is through the experience of his own work, uh, but, but I do think he, he's a bright star who, who, who talks a lot about um, you know, connecting what history teaches us. And he's going to talk about what history was like and what present, whatever is happening at present is going to be seen quite differently, probably in context to what happened earlier. So a very quick line on Madhav. He's an architect and urbanist. Uh, at present, the principal architect at Anagram Architecture. He graduated from the school of Planning and Architecture Delhi in 2001 and co-founded Anagram Architects with Vaibhav Demri. Uh, formally established in 2004, the, the practice is considered to be one of the emerging practices which commits towards delivering deeply contextual design. And it's such a pleasure to hear that because to know that design actually is in context to everything that we need or we have around us. It's nothing to just, it's not just aesthetics alone. It's not whims. It's not just fulfillment of desires. And uh, he's talking about his desire, his designs, encouraging sustainable lifestyle. So a lot to know what that means. So I'm going I want to invite uh, Madhav to talk a little bit more uh, to expand on the kind of work he's done. And I do want to remind him there were three works that I've heard of a lot. Uh, and I'm going to ask him to talk about that. But before that, um, let me invite you, all of you who are listening in today, if you have any questions while the conversation is going on, please type it in and our team will take it up. Uh, we'll take up the questions at the end of the sessions. And if we cannot finish it, we are definitely getting back to you later on. So Madhav, welcome. And please talk about all the exciting work you have done. Um, Thank you. Can, can I just quickly say that there's a, there's a um, Kochi Biennale you had done uh, in 2018. If you would like to start off with that. Okay, I'll, I'll just try and... Uh... So, unfortunately, I didn't know the order in which um, okay. I'd be asked to present my project. So, they, it's here. So, that was the, uh, it's a Biennal pavilion that we'd done in 2018, the last Kochi Biennal. And uh, it's a project we call Kudaram, which, okay. is, uh, which means tent in uh, Malayalam. Right. So, okay. So, uh, can we just go back a slide, uh, Tarika, please, one to the first slide. So, basically, we started in 2001, as you said, and 19. So, this is, we are like 18 years old, which uh, basically makes us a major or an adult. And therefore, 18 years is about the time when you start thinking about what you, know, you should be doing, really, after all the fun and games have died down. Uh, next, please. So, I'll... Um, take you through my, this is a, a project that we hold very, very close to our hearts. It's called SHRDC, South Asian Human Rights Documentation Center. We built it way back in 2006. Mm -hmm. And it's a really tiny project. It's only on built on a 50 square meter plot. So it's five meters by 10 meters. Um, next, please. So it's very interestingly positioned though. So that little black box in the 3D that you see at the center of the image is where the site was. So as you can see, it's a corner plot. 
uh, 55 meters by 10 meters, and it sits at a very interesting edge. It sits at the edge of Sabdajang Enclave and Humayun Port here in New Delhi. Uh, and what's uh, really interesting about that context is that it's the edge of what is called the formal city. and humayunpur is what is we refer to as an urban village now various people have different perceptions about this but there's an edge over there so folks on humayunpur side usually don't interact with people in sabdajang enclave side even though they both share this really large expansive maidan or community green but no one actually that becomes a no man's land no one uses it because there are these kind of perceptions of each other that people had so this was a interest very i mean this is really speaking our first built architectural project so next please and you know it is that corner that edge which uh, humayunpur and sabdajang enclave uh, <clears throat> kind of share that kind of brings out brought out the architectural design of this project so we said that has to be an empathetic edge it has to reflect the movement on that street of that street corner uh, and you know the residents of humayunpur were all urban migrants so they all came in uh, they use urban villages for cheap housing they don't have refrigerators they don't have air conditioning so what they do is every morning and evening when they go up and down this uh, stretch next to our building they're actually shopping and there's a lot because as you know there's a little bit of a street vendor corner there they buy vegetables to go home and cook and so on and so forth so very active buzzing sort of street corner so we thought why not try and see if we can reflect that activity next please so what we did was that um we thought can we create something out of brick because obviously the budgets for this project as you can imagine small plot small budget so you know we thought let's can we do something without getting into cladding and plastering and stuff can we just keep it to the natural beauty of the uh, basic uh, material itself and then we started working on geometries uh, looking at what would happen if you take a three brick stack and twirl it and if you twirl it can you maintain the center of gravity and so we designed this wall and we realized that you know while working on this pattern working on site we just graduated we were full of ourselves and our autocad drawings and we had a very we had to we had a very humbling experience on site because it was the masons who really because this big wall could not have been built <laughs> in the way we were taught um and it was actually working with masons hands on that we realized that there was a geometry that was possible to replicate on site what's interesting is like unlike other walls this wall does not get built from one end to the other you know course by course um it's actually stitched so there are five masonry teams that work together and it's actually more like a fabric and i think when one looks at the wall that's the lightness that comes out of this kind of ability to remove bricks create porosities it almost behaves like a fabric and in essence that's what it did it kind of protected the building like a parda mm -hmm. uh, or a curtain uh against the sun which was falling on you know the 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 10 meter side is what faces the sun so kind of fulfilled all its functional requirements and then also tried to make a kind of empathetic gesture to the public uh around it next please so these are some views you can see so you know the interesting thing is the staircase lines up with the building so when you're climbing up and down the staircase you're running parallel to the street so you can make eye contact with people on the street so it's a beginning of a conversation start i've seen people buy bananas through the holes in the wall you know <laughs> from the vendors below um yeah, so you know, but, i've seen uh, kids see, running around with a stick uh, you know bricks make a really uh, sorry i wanted to comment on this i mean i i see the wall almost as a living thing you know with the sunlight <laughs> That's very kind. And of course, as you But say, it, that you, you it does become a living thing primarily because of how people use it. So I was just telling you, there's I once went there about six, seven years after it was built, um, and I came across these two kids who had these two sticks on their hand and uh, in their hands, and they were running alongside the wall, treating the bricks like a bit of a xylophone. You know, <laughs> bricks make a sound when you hit them. Yes. So they would just run the stick along the side and kind of uh, sound like a xylophone. So they were having a party. So that. so the wall a wall does not just belong to the building it belongs to the city it belongs to the street so uh, this was a very good learning uh, thing for us to learn so early in our career you know that it's it's it, you know when we draw it is just two parallel lines but it has a lot more meaning um next piece and this is i wanted to kind of shock you guys with like a complete opposite <laughs> of Uh, SHRDC in terms of this kind of territorial border between uh, private and public. 
Now, this is on the edge, not of a community green, but it's on the edge of an industrial estate. So there are lots of truck traffic. There's a lot of ugly views up front. And the people, the clients, the family who lives here is a kind of a multi-generational family. It's a joint family. Um, and, you know, what's begun to happen is that we've started living in apartments that are designed to house nuclear families. But culturally, Indians tend to, you know, stick on to their joint families. Um, so we wanted to create social spaces inside the house. That was kind of key because, uh, you know, the way things had been before COVID and lockdown and work from home, we were all kind of in our separate universes outside. Mm -hmm. and the home would be like this oasis, this kind of calm, peaceful thing that we want to just shut out. And then even in the house, because you're on different floors, uh, you don't actually end up hanging out with your family so much. You're, you're basically just uh, stuck with a screen, you know, and uh, like we are right now. But, um, but, but so this was an interesting exercise to try and understand a building as a breached volume, a broken volume, a monolithic solid volume that gets cracked and broken. So that's why it's called cleft house. The cleft refers to the break in the middle. Um, so this is done with, um, so the other thing is about luxury and sh you know, people when they build houses, they like to show off a little bit, right? To kind of show that, you know, they've got the ability to build their own house. That's a, not a mean achievement nowadays. Um, and you always find like in interior design, people say, was there marble flooring? Because that's like premium. If you have marble flooring, Italian marble flooring, that's like, you know, you, you really splurge. And that's a lot of marble flooring that's coming from Italy, <laughs> you know, to satisfy our desire to show off. Um, and what we realize is you don't have to kind of spend, you know, the, if, if you don't put marble horizontally, if you put marble vertically, it's a gorgeous material. I mean, that's why it's luxurious. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has really, the true sense of marble is its transparency. You know, you realize that. You realize that very wafer thin marble is actually transparent. It's not opaque. And when light bounces off marble, like Taj Mahal looks awesome and beautiful because the way light bounces off it. So we thought, why not clad the front of this complete windowless uh, introverted house uh, in marble and then, you know, watch just light play magic on it. Uh, so that's what we did. And uh, next piece. So I have a question for you quickly. Sure. So what came first? Was it the name of the house or did the idea <laughs> come from the name? <laughs> the name of our projects always happen afterwards. Um, okay. So Webhav and I have this theory so that we are very uh, possessive about anagram architects because it's the first and only thing we've productively done in our lives after graduating. So um, every project that anagram produces is a little bit of a baby for us. So we namkaran karte hum. So we kind of name our projects. So once we do it for us, also, it helps us reflect on the concept of the project, okay. the client, how we felt. Um, mm -hmm you know, when we built it and so it's, it's a, it's a nice memory maker. So we like to name our projects at the end of it. Okay. So as you can see, it's actually a traditional courtyard house uh, mm -hmm. with a very, very narrow front and a very, very, uh, you know, exclusive entry, if you like. And then that helps you work the vertical volume scale of the volume that, you know, the scale of the opening suddenly is very soaring. It's, it's kind of uh, vertical because of the, the slit size opening that it is right. and that kind of draws you in and once you in once you're in next please you enter this crazy almost deconstructed courtyard but actually it's a very traditional courtyard house there's a shared internal space that is usable in different times of the day uh, the front of the house is open uh, but has windows so you can control the climate you can create a venturi effect. So there's a nice gentle breeze always flowing through the courtyard because of the shape of the front of the house and the kind of thermal stacking that happens. So this air in this courtyard heats up and slowly rises to the top uh, and it draws in air from outside where we have, you know, so, so it kind of has this kind of very cool breeze kind of effect on it. And every balcony of every room looks into this house. So there are about eight members across different generations in this house and um, you know, and then there's this crazy curving staircase. Next, please. Um, if, so, you know, these are the plans. So you can see that crazy geometry workout. So it's really, we took a block volume and we broke it to let in light, air, uh, which, you know, the thing is, uh, more we live in apartments, the more there's a very sharp line between what is inside and outside. And, you know, they, they, under lockdown, that's like a big problem because you can't go out into the parks, you can't do anything. 
and if your balcony is only three feet, two feet, then really speaking, it's uh, it's not a much. There's no not much internal usable space, and definitely the space is not social. A three foot balcony or a two foot balcony is not a social balcony. So this house is about not public sociability but private sociability. What's 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 social for a family? How does a family get together, have fun? You know, upper you know you call out and say ki khana tayar hai, niche aa jao. Then you come down. There's a party. If you don't want, if your kids are having a party, you don't want to be part of it. You can just withdraw to your room, but you can keep an eye on them so that they're not up to any kind of naughtiness. <laughs> so those sorts of um, ideas have informed this design. So Next this week. design is really made for the lockdown. And <laughs> yeah, it's got a face study. mask. We can have it as a case study then. Okay, yeah. thank you. Let's go to the next one. Next, please. I think I'll quickly run through some. I think there are um, so yes. these are some images of how the forms happen. And there's Utre, and this has to do. This is similar, but these are kind of young. The the children have grown up, so they want a little bit more privacy. So we've stuck to the same um, kind of you know have different floors with different living spaces, no courtyard. But they said we want a unique house. So this is where you come, you know, where houses become symbols of pride. Um, so we said, okay, a way to make a unique house is to have a house that has no straight walls. So we made the entire house with only curved walls. Why? Because then you're not, you can't buy material from all over the world and make it. The reason why it's exclusive is everything in this house is handmade, and the reason why everything is handmade is because everything is curved, so it can't be machine made. Uh, and are they sourced locally? Yes. So it's all very simple material. It's cast in C2 terrazzo. um stones from quartzite stones from near delhi um you know there's green walls there's there's a lot of wood work involved so all that is keekar there's uh, some of the wood has been reclaimed from a ship breaking yard in um, in alang so there have been the, so you know so we've tried our best to kind of say can you create luxury and exclusivity using very very humble materials and this is what we came up with we'll just run through these images so i'll just you can see how we've handled the curves the details how so those each of those fins is handmade um we've looked at how the sun works the wind works um next please you know and then a lot of our architecture has to do with material and detailing and and you know you really kind of zoom in and try and figure out how material meets like different types of material meet at a corner and a curve so on and so forth uh next please and then you get like interesting seating you can you know this was a uh, there's a there's a uh, designer out of ahmedabad called man singh who designed that um, the little yeah. chandelier you got there yeah. but above the chandelier is actually seating as you can see mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. so instead of saying figuring out which floor you're on with a number you can make out when you with the lift opens and you see the door you you understand which floor you're on yeah. uh, so as That's you go cool. up and down the house That's next cool. curve walls uh, bricks so a lot of detailing comes out of the curvedness of the house how do you manage straight materials in a curved surface uh, next please you know there's lights inside the walls lights inside the doors next so the bar considering now we are all dry so <laughs> i thought yeah. it's you know photo of some large bottles of alcohol um but also this you know the we get the more affluent we get we seem to go further and further away from nature so utre is actually a question of why can't luxury be more green like mm-hmm. why can't i have the luxury of having plants right outside my window or a curry patta plant just outside my kitchen window you know so i can just reach out and pluck herbs and use it for my cooking um next please and that's the idea you know Uh, uh aromatics and herbs and things are spice of life they are just like conversations are so here is perch which is a wine and coffee bar both those drinks are supposed to enhance conversations amongst uh, you know to get help like ice breakers they considered and both of them rely very heavily on aroma so perch was actually an exercise in designing a really nice smelling place <laughs> <laughs> so if i could just say that is it a um, coffee house or is yeah, it it's a, a coffee and wine bar in khan market all right, all right. uh it used to be a, a tandoori a punjabi restaurant called pure punjab which mm-hmm. was wall to wall paneling with wall uh, plywood and mirrors and we reused about 80% of that plywood i'll show you next please mm-hmm. so if you see that ceiling that's all the wall paneling that we stripped off we used there 
you know, the windows of these shops in Khan Market are usually darkened. And we wondered why, because if you come to a market, it's, it's not just to shop, it's also to see and be seen. So, you know, uh, Perch has to be understood as a place where you come, where you could come on your own and make friends. You know, that's the kind of space. We didn't want to create an exclusive sort of a uh, joint. Uh, uh, we got wood from, uh, you know, a key curd. We discovered, lo you know, qualities of local wood. Key curd, jamun, these are excellent woods. They're waterproof. They smell gorgeous. This right. woodwork in this uh, restaurant really, you know, kickstarts the smell. Next, next please. We can keep running through them. These are just some views. We yeah. grew a tree in the middle of the restaurant. So um, I was trying to get you to talk about your Binale yeah, pavilion, if you have it here, is <laughs> Kudaram. Kudaram. So Kudaram is a pavilion. Now see, usually pavilion. So, sorry, is... mother. Can I yeah. ask? Can I want? I want to include the the all the participants in this particular thing because we have a poll question for oh, them. Sure, sure. Then we are going to check out what their answer is. Sure. So the poll question is, what aids the design success of an exhibition pavilion? Is it being transparent and inviting, being inclusive and glamorous, or being exclusive and including technology? I think it's a lot of player words, but mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, we want to hear what you have to say. All right, so I'll continue. Um, you know, the oh, answer is, really uh, except I would like you to comment on the on the feedback that comes to us. So all right, all right. it comes. Let's wait. Yeah. All right, there it is. Oh, it talks, most of them feel that the success of an exhi exhibition pavilion lies in it being transparent and inviting. That's a wonderful <laughs> thought. Good. I don't know how correct that you words, are, Father. Well for Kudaram, because that's, I think, what we were trying to do. Okay, that's lovely. Then. So, so I'm glad people agree with us. Okay. Uh, but let me try and tell you a little bit about it. Now, Kochi Biennale is, I think it's considered a, amongst the largest art biennales in the world now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in this lovely, gorgeous town of Kochi in Kerala. I mean, I, one of the big pluses of working on this project was you get to, got, I got to visit Kochi for a period of time. You know, mm -hmm. I ate really well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, I had a really nice time working That's on That's one definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, the thing is that, you know, art has always, when art is thought of as a possession, then it becomes exclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, but more and more, and the reason why art is considered a possession is usually because art is considered an object. It's a painting or a sculpture or something like that. And then you want to have it and then you buy it. And then once you buy it, you want to keep it in your house and either only keep it like private or then show it to only select few people who are lucky enough to see it. You know, that sort of thing. Whereas now art is, contemporary art is post-material, right? It's got nothing to do with the object. It's got to do with the experience of art. And then that happens, it has to become more public because then people want to know how you're making that art and what does it mean when you're making it and what does it mean after you're making it and what is art? What is making art? Making a movie could be art. Art films are there. You could have a musical performance is art. It's a performing art. So, so Biennale, while it had galleries in which, you know, they repurposed warehouses in Kochi, old warehouses, abandoned warehouses in Kochi to create the gallery spaces, they didn't have a performative space. So this was the brief given to the uh, us saying that there is a yard called Cabral Yard in 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 Port Kochi, uh, which needs to kind of house a let's say an auditorium for the lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. uh, next, please. Um, you can just huh. so you know when we thought about a pavilion and especially when we said okay it has to do so many different things, but the fact is if it's a black box which is your normal typology of an auditorium is a black box you know you have to enter it once you enter it you have to put your cell phones on silent you you know inside there is ac outside there is no ac uh, inside you can watch the performance outside you're left out uh, so if you're late like i usually am as tarika will know uh, <laughs> uh, you know you you get left out i mean there's a there's a there's a penalty for being late in a black box auditorium Whereas in a Biennale, you you know, people come in, go out, you know, you should not, you should be allowed to be free, right? So that was one very important part of this design. And then there's a question that, you know, 
what is art that is if art is if art is now suddenly open to discussing how it's made then why not architecture why must we have finished buildings why can't we see the interior the skeleton the meat of architecture as well uh, you know and and in a sense that kind of demystifies and makes architecture more accessible once you understand how something is made it starts appearing a little more friendly than if you didn't understand how it was made then it is a, perhaps a little too awe inspiring so what we did was we created a earth berm we kind of piled up soil to one side we built extremely sustainably here so this thing is designed to be dismantled and completely disappear uh, you know all the metal comes off uh, there's bamboo there's uh, bamboo mats uh there's re uncut reuse reusable cement panels there's uncut um poly polycarbonate sheeting um so all this is and and i really must tell you that i really am so grateful to the team that worked on this the contractors the workers on site because they pulled this off in two months time right after the floods so right after uh, the kerala floods they worked right through that many of them lost their homes but they still persisted because you know they felt that the bnl is is something that's important for them it was from a sense of pride that they were saying we we let this happen so you know i mean while i get the credit for designing it i can't talk about it unless those guys had put in that effort and you know it bears a mentioning uh next please so what if you are inside neither inside nor outside in an auditorium what if you are neither above ground nor underground uh what if you are not very clear what is the inside you know how, where if you start blurring those edges what is what is a column what is a beam what is the tree branch what is bamboo these are all questions that merge and dissolve in this pavilion and you get this nice dappled sunshine that comes through if you look up you see these towering trees that close over the uh, pavilion if you want to sit outside and enjoy the sea breeze you can sit outside and watch what's happening inside if it's too hot and there are too many mosquitoes and you want air conditioning you can come in if you want to answer a call you can step out so that's the kind of flexibility that we thought we designed this pavilion for next please and you know we worked with bamboo craftsmen and steel makers and it was so much fun trying to discover these details of how you know you can structures work how metal works how bamboo works um you know and how people can have fun if if the if the architecture is friendly you know then people become friendly if architecture uh doesn't judge you then people stop judging you the moment you start architecture starts drawing walls and says this is inside you're not allowed then that transmits itself to people who use the building then you become an insider and an outsider you know so we were trying to question all these things through this pavilion next please so these are just some views of how it's been used they had a really cool b boy uh session <laughs> so that's wonderful wow i just that have has. to say that uh, 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 we are really i'm trying to at least um, um imbibe all the thing all your values that you're talking about and showing us through your projects i'm very sure we will get some more time to reflect on it when we go through the other topics that we have here for you we are going to talk about covid 19 i think the last time that we were discussing what covid 19 meant for you personally for me and for the other members who were present that time we all seemed a little bit down i want to say that we have been in lockdown for so many weeks um we probably are now getting used to being only on the computer the screen has become our home or my parameter of being normal uh in fact my body rhythm is getting used to a small space like my home i only walk from room to room so ergonomically anthropometrically i'm just wondering will my body ever get used to being outside larger space <laughs> larger distances and, and so of course this is a little bit on the extreme but let me ask you that this event is not something new uh the event is new but i would say the phenomena is not new because there have been instances where all of us have had to undergo this feeling of insecurity some kind of fear at the same time huge hopes that something is going to turn out to be better mm. would you call it a disruption and if so i do want to hear from you what your thoughts are on you know how this is going to impact all of us but there's a poll question for all our viewers because we want to know from you before that what do you think is covid-19 an opportunity or is it a disruption 
So please put in your uh, answers. It's a disruption, it's an opportunity, it's neither, not sure. And after that, we are going to hear what Madhav has to say. Oh my God, this so is people. just wonderful. This is wonderful. I can tell you we are going to win the war. Absolutely. 73% have said it is an opportunity. Uh, maybe I'm on the older side. so. But yes, I can sense that this is such wonderful news. And this is exactly what you were talking about, Madhav. Would you like yeah. to hear it? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm so happy to know that folks are uh, kind of looking for the positive and are hoping to find it. And I, I, I just like to try and explain how I think um, it is an opportunity. It's actually, here's the thing, it is a disruption, uh, but not all disruption is bad. In fact, for a designer, disruption is always good because it means a change in status quo and therefore more opportunities show up because we are lateral thinkers, we are not sequential thinkers. If we thought in a sequence, then a disruption would be really disruptive. Uh, would be really not a nice thing, you know. Um, so it is a disruption, but I do see it as a positive uh, disruption. Um, and this is, to begin with, let's try and understand how we are placed today in history, right? So the first thing is in terms of how we interact as human beings across the world, through how cultures interact, right? We are what you would call post-globalized. Now, this is also a result of our politics. Um, most countries you see the politics of those countries and the economics of therefore the economics of those countries are turning more introverted. They're trying to see how can we stop being reliant for political reasons on say for example China. Um, you know, uh, and that has started happening I think uh, post uh, the kind of social revolutions that have happened through the internet. Uh, that people have actually, so it's this kind of thing where the virtual opens up, but the real kind of physical or it's not really physical because you're not in proximity you're across the globe from people, but this kind of physical distance kind of closes down and shrinks um, and you become more introverted. So it's post globalized and you have to understand globalization is not since we liberalized in the nineties, globalization, that's when we uh, got to access the fruit of globalization, but Globalization is a story that's been going on for a good two, I would say about 300, 350 years or more because it starts with trade, it starts with exploration, uh, various people, you know, the discovery of Southeast Asia by the Tamil cultures, the, the discovery of America by the Portuguese, uh, these kind of voyages for various reasons, right? For religion, for trade, for so many reasons that we spread. Um, and that led to eventually colonialism. And then colonialism, uh, you know, ended and many nations became independent and democratic. And then they started looking at trade as a way of connecting with people. Now, all of that seems to have been disrupted. But it, even before COVID, it had gone through a fairly quick demise in the last 10 years. So we're post-globalized. But the result of the globalization is that we are hyper-connected. So thanks to the internet and before COVID, thanks to the amount of flying that we were doing, we were hyper-connected. Anything and anyone could go from point A to point B on the globe. And the result of these two exercises and our hunger for fossil fuel because of these two things have made us well and truly climate change. I think uh, it's, it's silly to now ask, are we going through climate change? I think we should now well and truly accept that we're going through climate change. I mean, I cannot remember any uh, of the month of May having rains in Delhi ever, uh, but that's how it is. Um, and so we need to, as designers, be aware of where we are. So, uh, next, please. I'm going to take it. Um, okay, if I may take it a little. Do you want to talk about this first? Because I would like to talk to you about the way we perceive our spaces, personal as well as social. Right. So maybe I can talk about it with this. Along with because, this, that would be yeah, better. See, yes. when a pandemic happens, like we are witnessing right now, there is this very, you know, you human beings, like any other animal, live in mortal fear of their lives, right? So they want to preserve life. And a lot of our social activities and all are essentially um, exercises of a mind that are away from that animal instinct. The way we are social is very different from the way other animals in the king animal kingdom are social. But we share this kind of fear for life um, uh, with other animals, uh, preservation. And 
spaces have always had perceptions associated with them and pandemics diseases that kill human beings in large numbers are usually these points in time when the reality of preservation of life kind of cuts through any kind of other uh, exercise that we've done as humanity so i'd like to take you through history so and how that has changed perception of space and therefore design of space so bubonic plague for example in the 1300s and 1400s killed massive amounts of people across the country, uh, across the world um, it was a fast moving thing it used to spread through rodents and pests uh, rats uh, fleas uh, people weren't very hygienic at that point in time people would very rarely bathe um you know and we didn't have all these products to keep ourselves clean and hygienic all the time so the realization that there was a vector or a pest involved in the spread of this was very rapid and that had an impact on houses so suddenly you start seeing plinths so buildings started going up a few steps before they start really the ground is no longer on the ground um uh, you you started introducing various ways of keeping rodents out of your houses uh your toilets were kept well outside the house homes didn't have attached toilets at that point in time streets used to be a mess no one cared what the road or the outside was like as long as their home was free of um, any kind of rodents and pests cockroaches things like that um so that started impacting but then after some time people forgot the plague you know through the 1500 1600s then architecture started flowering again and you started seeing ornament and this and that and then Uh, in the 1800s and 1700s, you suddenly started getting pandemic after pandemic of cholera and dysentery and TB, and these were all very, very scary because a lot of people suddenly died. And you have to remember, medical science wasn't as good as it is today, so we didn't have all these curves that needed to be flattened and all. No one knew what was happening. They just thought God must be angry or something. And this is, but then again, architecture and design. changed so by the late 1800s early 1900s there was this realization because what had happened was people had invented the germ theory or discovered the germ theory they realized that disease spreads through germs and germs spread through uh, fecal matter sewage um, you know dirt dust so immediately the response so there was the invention of the personal the toilet the 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 commode the wc and that got placed in a septic sanitary manner inside the house so suddenly you started designing houses with toilets um kitchens were usually kept open but now you said okay i will evacuate water was supplied but also removed through sewage pipelines and so a lot of our houses started taking up we started getting infrastructure for sewage pipe pipes for electricity uh, pipes for water and sewage and wires for electricity and so on and so forth to keep ourselves warm so i mean get tb uh, to keep ourselves dry uh, you know to remove uh, dampness from the air so on and so forth so although you start seeing and what's interesting is by the 1920s this is impacted stylistically so you start seeing minimalism you start seeing the removal of ornament so no dust can gather or surfaces that can be cleaned very easily smoother surfaces metallics uh, plywoods um you start seeing sculptural uh, niches you know where dirt and filth and germs could get stuck and things could be easily cleaned furniture became lighter uh, so that you could move it and clean behind it uh you know so these sorts of uh changes started happening and you had the modernist movement uh which resulted in that and that became uh you know minimalism and then that became uh ikea <laughs> eventually so madam um, a question yeah. here for you now what happens after covid 19 are you going to suggest some some yeah, design so these changes perceptions are what we need to look at so if we were to understand ourselves right now next please we can um take a view on how we are we are a lot we are a large population very social we like hanging out with people we like talking and us as a designer these numbers are incredible we are by 2039 will be 1.5 billion people right uh mm-hmm. and that is a huge huge number and what is this this is not like people living all by themselves on mountain tops we are all in each other's faces because whether we are in villages or cities and all we like hanging out culturally that's who we are that's where we have fun next please um and then we've been enabled by technology so all of us are forever creating content and we are distributing content and we are eating content on you know online so the virtual space for us is i think a very fertile ground so as designers we need to keep an eye on that next please 
And we also have to look at how we consume energy for the numbers of people. What does it mean for electricity to be in anyone's hands? What does it mean for future generations to be light, resilient, be able to keep up with calamities of climate change and pandemics and bounce back and become the kind of happy people we naturally are? We are naturally a very happy people. So perceptions of space, of climate, of fear, I think we will come back. And we just need to be as designers, facilitators of that resilience. Um, it's not so much about sustainability anymore. Uh, it's more about resilience. It's for our, all of us as a society, as a race, as, as, as a species to understand what does it mean for us to bounce back and how we all are actually reliant on each other to be able to bounce back. I mean, the biggest thing about COVID is that it's not you. I mean, it's, you have to assume you carry the germ, not someone else. Uh, so you have to wear the mask, you have to stay indoors, you have to wash your hands. Uh, you can't say that, oh, I'm okay. You, you have to assume that you are a potential carrier of this disease at all times. And that's a huge responsibility. Uh, so, so mother, on that have... note, I'm going, to ask you some, I'm going to ask you some questions on traveling because we have been hearing a lot of arrangements by the government to you know, transport the migrants to their cities, to their hometowns. And what does it mean in terms of for travel in future? For us, it has been physically always moving into another place, experiencing culture, food, etc. of that place. And getting that experience which transports you into another physicality. With the new situation, do you think travel is going to be easier? Is, of course, it's going to be different. But what does it mean to, uh, what do you envisage it to be? I think, see, traveling is something that is the ultimate thing for a social animal, for a human being to undertake, right? To discover something new. It's, it's what makes us tick. So I don't think, so in the, it's best to look at COVID in general in three time frames: short term, medium term, and long term. So obviously, in the short term, everyone is stuck at home. We can't travel, so on and so forth. Eventually, the curve will flatten worldwide, uh, hopefully with very few deaths, but that's what's going to happen. Eventually, there might be a, there might be a vaccine, there might not be a vaccine. You know, we've survived an AIDS epidemic without a vaccine. So there are, there are ways in which one can deal with disease and death, uh, mass death. Uh, but that's the short term. In the medium term is when the perception of space kicks in. When you start starting to normalize certain behaviors, and that's where designers play a very key role. What are these discoveries we make about ourselves in these times of crisis that we can use to kind of deal with similar crisis in the future? Uh, whether it's caused by, so you talk about migrants. Now, both you and I are equally migrants. I'm Tamil. I've come to Delhi and I can't, I speak much better Punjabi than I speak Tamil. Um, so I am an urban migrant, but I am an urban migrant with a home. So this is where I quarantine. I'm not desperate to get back. I've created enough cultural products around me to make this feel like a space that I feel comfortable in, not alien in. I have enough resources to not feel threatened. So these are the pressures in the short term. And designers must continually think now, it's as, almost as like a call to action to us, for us to try and see, can we, can we change this a little bit so that people don't go back rushing to this notion of home that's a thousand kilometers away. And then that comes into travel for pleasure, right? So now if you look at travel for pleasure and hospitality and tourism and so on and so forth, you know, I didn't travel abroad until about 10 years back you know, and uh, for the first time, maybe a little bit more, 10 or 15 years back. And for me, it became this thing, I have to try and see as much of the world as I can. And then in the past two or three years, Nian, to be honest, I've realized that, you know, in this thing, I've never actually seen what's around me. I haven't traveled to places that are gorgeous and beautiful and tourism, un you know, un untouched beaches and untouched mountains to hike through and cycle that. through. Yeah. I cycle a lot. So, you know, uh, for me, these sorts of discoveries closer home are, I mean, then you wonder then, you know, why waste the money? No? <laughs> it's not a waste of money, but you, you just, I think what COVID is making us do is in our perception is to try and understand that, look, there's beauty everywhere if you hunt for it. Like yesterday, or I think two or three days back, two little sunbirds started making a little nest outside my window. Uh, had the pollution not cut down, we wouldn't be seeing a friend of mine saw a hornbill in Delhi. Can you imagine? Yeah. So you, you'll you start discovering beauty if you look for beauty. So I think it's best. That's why I'm glad everyone's so optimistic about the future. 
because it's with that optimism that you discover opportunities. So, 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 since you've brought that up, I want to now go back to my wise friends. I realize these participants are wiser than many of us around. Uh, I want to ask them another poll question, and that's the last before we go on to take all their questions. So, the poll question says, which of the modes of transport will be the most optimal, considered most optimal post COVID 19? And let's see what our participants think. Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> I know it's a tough question, but I'm sure they have a better answer than us. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. I just want to point out here, Nian, while yeah. they do. Uh, you know, the more I think about it, I think it's more important to, for designers to think about the not physical travel, but the travel and transmission of ideas. I think in that hyper-connected post-globalized world, that's actually a resource that we can use quite well. So it's actually the internet, the ability that like how we are doing now. I mean, we never used to do webinars and Zooms earlier. Sure. Um, but you know, this is something to really for all of us to think about. Oh, there again. Well, really <laughs> smart. I have to say, I personally am not a big fan of, well, it says personal vehicles. So that's it's a little personal bit of a vehicle. vehicle. No. I'm not a big fan of cars. Madhav, uh, you can take your cycle <laughs> or even your little scooter <laughs> by so leg. My cycle is my personal vehicle. It's, it's my non-motorized transportation. <laughs> they are quite right in pointing it out. Well, there's no right or wrong, but I would say, that no, it's just my choice. I, I, I enjoy cycling, so that's what Absolutely. I do. I stopped driving a car about two years back. Absolutely. So, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to ask, Madhav, you have to be ready with so many questions for you. Uh, sort of, I'll start with the first one. Sure. Um, did, you, did you use some parametric software for designing the wall? That was the first, the SHRDS, I think. Or it was organically done on the site? Ah, no, no, no parametrics. We, this is well before we barely started using AutoCAD then. So actually, it was AutoCAD. We kind of realized that we could use CAD software to create like detailed course by course drawings. So we kind of really tripped on that a little bit. So we just made all the drawings that were required for that wall. And unfortunately, they were all useless on site because oh. we never built a wall before Nian. We didn't know how a wall gets oh. built. So, so, so it was actually the masons who really laughed at us and said, you know, all you fancy college going boys uh, <laughs> with your drawings and your computer and model and all. And then they said, this can't be built. Uh, absolutely. And then with them, we worked on a actually a system, a technology, which is mm -hmm. basically three, we made these went back to the computer, figured out what the displacement angle between each brick was, okay. created a little plywood triangle that reflected that angle. And each mystery team, each, each Mason team carried that. That's how they were able to build it simultaneously uh, because they were working side by side and they all knew what each displacement of each brick was by placing that as a pattern, as a, they call it a farma here. All right. So, so thank you, Madhav. There's another one, uh, again, digging into the way you work. I'm sure this is inspiring the students. So where do you get inspiration for, for all these projects? Do you have pre ideas for the design or is it always project specific? Uh, and yeah, so would you be so able to I, share you with know, like, I, it's, you? This thing about inspiration, I just want to tell folks who are listening that I've been lucky enough to really enjoy my time as a designer. I think the first, more than inspiration and stuff, you need to be someone who can find joy in life. That's, that's, I think, one of the primary skills a designer needs to have. And when you are hunting for joy in life, how will you do it? You'll do it by looking at your world around you. And um, immediately around you, further away from you, you'll see how someone else's world is working. You'll put yourself in other people's shoes. Look at life and look, at, look for joy. Um, you know, what would make that person happy? That's, I, I think that is a more realistic thing. I mean, inspiration, I have an inspiration every day. I, I, I spend a lot of time uh, looking at other people's work. So one could even say that none of my ideas are original. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, keep yourself well informed. I read a lot. I watch a lot of things. Um, I try and 
keep up with uh, technology. I'm a bit of a geek. Uh, <laughs> I like to keep an eye on technology all the time. Um, and yeah, this just, is going you know, to this is going to be very inspiring. Yeah, I think I think I think happiness. I think that's that's where we are. That's where we need to be at all times. We need to be at a happy place. Okay. Okay. I'm very sure they are going to take some tips from here. So Harsh is asking. Since we are forced to stay indoors, how can we transform our homes to make them more bearable? I ah. can understand that. Ah. More, bearable, more, more literally. Bearable. <laughs> bearable. Comforting. Ah, someone spending a little bit too much time with their family. <laughs> really? Okay. No, it's a really interesting question. Understand? And all of us in studio are thinking about it. We're, we're doodling, mm-hmm. we're sketching, we're trying to figure out. Mm-hmm. And it's this thing because we spend so much time thinking of homes as escapes from the outside. I think that's the problem. If the moment that gets disrupted, there's no line between the outside and the, you know, your home and your office. When your home is suddenly now your office and you, you know, like after this, I'm probably going to go and wash the dishes and, uh, you know, and like hang out with folks in my family. Now, actually, I'm lucky enough to have a large enough house to have this room all to myself. (laughs) So I have that luxury. Uh, but I, I mean, the thing is that we always say we love family, but this is a point of discovery. How much do we love them? <laughs> and is there something is too much love? <laughs> so I think we need to transform. We need to, we need to, uh, we'll figure out new ways of arranging furniture, of designing furniture. Uh, we'll be able to create better backdrops than what I work. Look at how awesome Mian's backdrop is. Mine's, my cool painting is way it's too far. Planned. Sorry, I have to say. So I have to you might start it. having to design our workspace for Zoom. Um, you know, we did a lot of set design for TV and film when we were really young and starting off. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's a line of thinking that we are exploring in studio. Like what is a home on a Zoom, a Zoom video screen? <laughs> so in line with that, there's another question about office spaces. Do you think office spaces will become redundant as a result of the current situation? Or is there going to be some fundamental shift? I think the the usage of spaces is going to completely blur. We've we've tried to keep spaces and functionality in little buckets and silos. We say, oh, this is an office, or this is a commercial building, or that's a mall, or this is a school, or that's a college, or this is a home. What's now beginning to happen is, I think what will start happening is use is going to be defined by time and timing. So instead of having a building use, you have a temporal use or a time use. So the same space will function. So, you know, just before COVID struck, we were beginning to see co-living, co-working, pop-up stores, these sorts of things. Um, I think that last vestige of permanence that, you know, can I sleep in my co-working space? Uh, That's those questions are going to begin. They'll be, can I cook in my co-working space? Mm. Uh, can I cook? Not not a cafeteria. <laughs> can I cook? Yeah. Um, you know, so can I design a, a, a kind of a multi... So like when folks, I and mean, like, there are lots of young people here. So when you share an apartment, how do you kind of draw your privacy lines in an apartment? You know, your bedroom is yours, your bathroom is yours, but living room, kitchen, then the fridge ka shelf. <laughs> so we'll start discovering yeah. rules for all these things. Absolutely. Know? I think you can make your own rules as well. Yeah. Now's the time. This is the advantage of a disruption. There are no rules. Do your thing and discover uh, something. I have a very great question for you. And, and this is asking, uh, what is the basic underlying framework to get more humanity into your design? I mean, this is a wonderful uh, question if somebody's thinking about it. That's a very, 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 in, I wouldn't even call it an intelligent question. It's a wise it's a question. It requires question. a lot of thinking. It requires Absolutely. a lot of thinking because Absolutely. it requires a lot of self-judgment. Um, you need to be able to judge yourself as a designer, your own values. And I think it's a very key thing. Uh, I think somewhere down the line, uh, maybe even a hundred years back, we kind of forgot buildings are meant for human beings. And we kind of forgot that buildings are not meant to teach human being things. Uh, buildings are meant for spaces for people to live and create in, um, you know, to make, make ideas, make conversation, make things, make objects, um, make joy, you know. Um, and and that, that is that key to that empathy. You have to imagine yourself not designing a building, 
but the infrastructure to hold human occupation. You need to create a habitat, really speaking. And just like those two little sunbirds are creating their little habitat outside my window, very, very, a lot of hard work, a lot of eye for detail, a lot of sensitivity. Is the sun right? Will my partner be happy with this? Will they not be happy with this? You know, these are questions that, that empathy is very, very critical for us as a species. So I would, I would say that's a very, very wise question. Can't say I have the answer, but I'm hoping to discover it. And, I, I, and that's what we've tried to do in the past 20 years, uh, 19 or 18 odd years of us being around is try and understand, can we make, can we make ourselves and other people around us happy with our work? Right. Thank you for that. I think we all will have to reflect on it ourselves. So there's another, um, actually you have so many questions, Madhav. I think we have to do another webinar session with you. <laughs> but anyway, this is, this is about what are the yeah, design I skills that... Lot, okay. Nori, the more I talk, I, I think I'm so confusing. People will have, <laughs> will have questions. I just... <laughs> No, great. They, they know me know that. that when I start talking, I don't stop talking. They have, they want to interact with you. So, so uh, you know, one of our participants asking, what kind of design skills can I develop while being in the lockdown? Look, I think um, I'm using this time to learn about things I don't know about. So, um, but, but I'm my own boss. So no one in office is telling me I don't know something. <laughs> so mm -hmm. They all agree. I know everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm a reading a lot more. Um, I'm building an app. Uh, so there's, there's lots of interesting non-architectural life that I'm discovering. Uh, and I think we need to do because skills are no longer, you see, the thing is, since we are no longer going to office, not doing one thing, we're not being specialists. I think we need to, and that's a good thing for a designer to be a generalist. I think uh, the best designers are generalists. They're not specialists. Um, so just widen. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really see, there'll always be experts around. There'll always be expertise. The designer doesn't need to be an expert at anything. The designer needs to widen so that the designer can have lateral thinking, lateral, you know, can connect dots that other people normally won't connect. Um, and for that, you need width, not depth so much. So yeah, and of course, then, you know, brush up on your 3D skills and <laughs> Photoshop skills also. <laughs> but... Depends on how long the time, how long the lockdown is and how many dishes you have to do. <laughs> so, so I do think we are really, really short of time. But there is finally a question that I can answer. So Madhav, now it's my turn to talk. Yes. Uh, okay. So the question is, is it necessary to have an academic degree to become a certified designer? Uh, and the participant says that I do not have one, but so definitely have the courage and passion to produce high quantity, high quality and acceptable ideas. So, uh, well, I would, I would say that a professional training is important. Uh, degrees and diplomas or certificate courses, whatever may be the awards, it sort of certifies how long you have been training and, and where you have been training for, from. Um, most of the, when you say it is a certified award, it means that there is a, there is a thought process behind the structure of the program, the outcome that this, the participant will be able to, you know, display at the end of the training and the ability to have exposure to whatever is the requirement in that learning. So yes, it does make a lot of sense to be able to get into a, any formal education or training as you might like to uh, decide for yourself depending upon your situation uh, it's also important that when you say you have great ideas that's wonderful because all of us would like to work with certain you know within a certain time frame with certain kind of um, mapping that helps us to proceed faster and maybe take on more complex work as we go along so I can only say that education or a lot of training, and I would say, of course, the better ones give you that, that, that platform and give you the methodology all of that. It always helps a lot. But that is not to say all geniuses come out only from formal education. However, I would suggest that if you don't have the time, you don't have the wherewithal right now to do a full term course, you should take up shorter programs and keep in touch with all that is happening around in the in the in this particular profession 
being a member of, of professional forums, uh, attending trade fairs, and keeping in touch with all the latest that's happening. Uh, I do think that will help you a lot. And of course, we are. Uh, I would personally like to advise you if you'd like to uh, be in touch with me. And let's see what can be done about that. I hope that helps you. Meantime, although there are many, many more, but I cannot unfortunately answer, get, get you to answer so many of them. You are a popular person, I must say that. But of course, I'm sure a lot of your platform is more popular than I am. A lot of insights you're shared is, uh, is helping them. Uh, okay, so they would like to have your website and how to reach him. Uh, so would you be able to... Yeah, yeah. Like to uh, so website is anagramarchitects.com, but um, website is a little static. So you can keep up with us on our social media handles. We are on Instagram, we are on Facebook. You should all be able to find it. You can Google us, they'll all tumble down. We are, we are search engine optimized. <laughs> so. so it's anagram architects. Yeah, A N A G R A M A R C H I T E C T S. Right. Um, hi, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say that if we actually have a lot of, of uh, more questions, we can take a couple of more. It might spill over, but those who want to uh, stay on, if that's okay, uh, we can do a couple of more questions. Yes. Oh, that would be lovely. So, Mother, would we? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I better so, to do. another <laughs> very <laughs> interesting question. Mother, another interesting question. By Rachna, how important is it to use indigenous products in construction and while designing? Is so, it necessary to import import products such as marble? Great, <laughs> great question. I think I think you know that's the that's the power of disruption. That's the uh, you know the thing is we never mm -hmm. really thought, and you know there was you know people like you also you know assume that I'm sustainable, but I'll, let me assure you that when you build, you're killing a little bit of nature in any case. So the, you have to remember that responsibility. So you have to think really long and hard. You can't just randomly build stuff and say, Koi baat nahi, ke fir se that is what is sacrilegious. That is criminal because no other species on this planet does that. Uh, now, the thing is, we've always stressed on being local, but we've done it for sustainability reasons. And now what COVID has done is it's made it impossible to get material from outside. It's made it impossible from, for getting even labor or, uh, uh, you know, craft skills from very, very far away. Um, the great thing about India is we may not be industrialized, but we are great at handicrafts. We're great with like smaller objects that are handmade and those can always be transported. So, we don't need large marble slabs coming from Italy. No, but we need little Atangudi tiles. <laughs> so, they mm. come. Um, and of course, why marble? Suddenly you might discover some local stone, like a good solid quartzite, which has some, you know, crazy light play on it and like really trippy kind of stone. You can get it here. I mean, it's, we've never looked really, you know, and we've never thought about it. We, 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 we've, been, we've allowed ourselves to be led by the globalized markets. So I think now is the time where designers can kind of take a little bit back. So we look forward to many youngsters coming forward and, you know, taking, going ahead with a vision of what they would want to be doing. Yeah. I have another question for you. And this is about uh, what would be the impact of architecture and, and interior design in tier three cities? Wow, that's really specific. So Madhu, I do <laughs> yeah. hope you have some... Wow. <laughs> Very good answer for that. That's I, it's it's actually kind of scary because so tier that, three cities. Would you yeah, let me let me try and tell you for maybe other people who don't know it's it's the, the nature of the question is so precise that I'm actually wondering who yeah. do we know who's asked that question? At the moment, I don't have a name, but I'm okay. very sure somebody who's practicing right now in tier three cities. Okay, so there is something to think about. We've always looked at urban and rural as two opposites and there's a very sharp dividing line between the two but that's not how it has been in India. In India we've got various forms of proto-urbanism that stretches from absolutely rural to like megapolis Bombay, right? So now the thing is that if you look at how migration happens in India, the bulk of the migration is actually in the tier 2, tier 3 cities. Unfortunately, as urban designers especially, we are trying to make all those cities tier one cities, which is completely wrong. 
we need to actually build capacity and humane living conditions that are culturally resonant in you so imagine right now you have guys who are trying to cross 1000 kilometers 500 kilometers to go home uh what if they only had to go home 40 kilometers they could have walked home you know i mean you can walk about 20 30 kilometers a day no problem i you know it's it's you can cycle about 20 yeah. kilometers in an hour yeah. so uh so now you start wondering about your indores your coimbatore your tirupur your you know small town bankura your your uh, you know dhanbad your you know these towns are actually where india lives mm-hmm. and that as an indian designer is a huge opportunity so i keep I, that's why I'm interested in saying who asked this question because okay, I've got the name. Do you want to know? No, I no, hope, never mind. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's Avtar. I hope Avtar. This is helping. Hi Avtar. Thanks for that question. I mean, it's yeah, it's really it's uncanny a... because this is something that I've been toying around with within studio. We've been talking about it is to try and say not not practice uh, uh you know not to create architecture for urban India or urbanism. but to try and consider what the notion of a proto urban is what is almost urban so you have your cell phone towers but you also have farm lands um you will have uh, you know this kind of non you know somewhere between a village and a city that that sort of space is what i think where the future lies so okay thank you so much mother uh, i'm sure avtar this would be of uh, you would be you will find this useful uh there's another question which i think i will also attempt to answer and mother it would help also to have your opinion yeah you go first uh, uh what according to you is the right time to start an architecture firm uh any advice so one is that i would advise you after your graduation i would definitely advise you to take some training as a in the stu- in one of the professional studios be around there for a while get to learn the ropes of the the whole practice what happens in the profession what, how how do they deal with clients how do they go around completing a project what is the whole process and system within the studio to enable it to be you know to to start and to complete so once you understand all that once you think that that's that's something which works for you the best practices the way the best way to work at it get to understand the commerce of the whole business a bit and then you may be ready to start but also to figure out whether you do have you made enough your your built your network of not only your vendors but probably looking for clients so a lot of these things are important and of course i'll ask um, madhav to his views so i have uh, two almost opposite views on this so i we ourselves started right after college so you know many people including our parents thought it was very foolish perhaps rightly so it was a terrible time to start but you know uh, i i would say that once you got your uh, so i think it's important exactly as you say to know the ropes of what is happening it's not the kind of profession you can just jump off at the deep end and try your luck it's not like um, you know it's not like a lot of entrepreneurial professions are like you know you could be a service provider of some kind and say okay i'll just start and let's see what happens architecture is not like that it's a little more complicated so once you've got your technical degree or your technical skills or whatever it is when you know that you have the skill set the, then you must learn from how to run the show like you rightly pointed out uh, what how do you communicate both with client with people you want to work for you um contractors laborers crafts persons how do you organize how do you lead teams these are all uh thing but the great thing about design is it's probably the only profession or it's it's the it's the profession that to my mind has the biggest amount of self discovery and it's the kind of profession where we like to tell ourselves you never stop learning very few other professions share that um uh, those characteristics so there will be a point in time where you know you're ready or there will be such a huge opportunity that comes your way where you're willing to gamble and say okay this opportunity is so great that i'm just going to start off on my own because now is when to do it uh and then you'll manage i mean once once you have that self discovery is central to your practice that you understand yourself while you're working 
um, you will know when you're ready. So I'd say, yeah, stick to Nain's advice and uh, get yourself your degree or technical qualification so that no one says, who are you to practice? And then once you're there, try and work with someone to understand the nitty gritty of running the show. That's, that's something that they don't teach you in design school. That's true. That's true. So, uh, you know, another question which is connected is, do you use ergonomics in your projects? Mm. How important is it to know ergonomics and how can I go about learning this? So uh, if I may just quickly say that yeah. ergonomics is, is one of the important elements that all designers have to learn, especially if you're going to be dealing with, uh, with products, you're going to be dealing with spaces, it's uses the products that you're going to be using. And, and hence, even interior designers, architects, product designers, we all need to be, uh, be knowing the ergonomics, basics of ergonomics and its application. Now, is it taught everywhere? I do believe it's taught in all formal education, such as at JSID, uh, we, have, uh, we have ergonomics running throughout almost all the main projects. Uh, since our learning is through projects, so we would have four projects in a year, you would at least have to deal with ergonomics in two major projects so that it helps you to understand not only the basics, but how does it get applied in any uh, project such as in personal residence or retail space, or let's say hospitality. So I think, uh, yes, it's very important. Um, do you have anything, uh, Madhav, which is... Well, no, no, not really. I mean, just that uh, design is meant for human beings. And it's yes. a study of human uh, body measurements, which is ergonomics, comfort levels. These are kind of critical. Correct. If you start designing for monkeys or other animals, then you need to understand and study their ergonomics. So, I mean, it's ergonomics is part and parcel of trying to design any form of interaction with an object. So. Okay. It's, it's a, it's Mother, a I have one last question for you because this is that particular question has been asked by many. So we have collated it and it is about what are the major advance, advancements or transformations that architects and interior designers will have to make against the backdrop of coronavirus. Will any safety security measures will be prioritized in the construction and design of houses? Sure. I think uh, there is a lot that's going to happen. Again, the important thing is to look at it in terms of whether it's a short-term thing, a mid medium-term thing, or a long-term thing. These changes that we will need to incorporate. Uh, and this is in terms of how it will transform the spaces that we actually produce, like our, the houses and the offices and stuff. So we will need to think through that. So there'll be a certain set of ideas that will come up that will help us deal with the short-term crisis. There will be a certain set of practices that we will try and inculcate an in office to ensure that in the medium term, we don't get fall victim to outbreaks uh, of the disease. And in the long term, we will need to deal with ideas of sociability and connectivity um, with the idea that if not Corona, many other such, I mean, like you've seen in history, this keeps happening. We never learn. Uh, so maybe this time we'll learn because uh, we are a lot more connected and there's a lot more memory virtually, uh, you know, recorded history like right now, <laughs> happening. So there's always a little bit of this memory that you, you know, you've forgotten what it was like in the, the bubonic plague or cholera epidemics of the earlier times. Um, <clears throat> but I think more important for us as designers is to understand how it will impact the design process and the studio structure. I think that is something that we are still trying to figure out. It's still early days. At least here in India, we've not yet got back in full form to understanding and seeing what all has to be done in the studio process. Um, and we're trying to discover new processes online when you're working from home. Should we do assembly line? Should we do collaborative? Uh, you know, so these will settle down. There'll be a huge change in authorship of design. The moment you can't uh, get your own product or space or furniture or architecture built, uh, you will need to think about intellectual property rights. So because you're gonna have to send it to some other place virtually where they will make it and someone else will pick it up. And so your control over these things will reduce. So these are very interesting times, I think, uh, you know, but then equally you could talk about design. Maybe design doesn't need to be so financialized. Maybe design can be open source, like all the best software are, you know, so, so these are things for all of us to design and discover for ourselves, our own values, our own comfort level, but it's very, very interesting times. And Absolutely. 
full of full of opportunities and as long as it puts you on the edge of the seat i think these are interesting times yeah. and i'm going to say thank you to you especially mother and to all our participants i think it's been really interesting um our evening is made for the day at least mm -hmm. and i would do think that we have learned something today from your views you have you have taken us through your work you've talked about what your insights are and i would think that there there are still many more questions but we would send them to you further for uh, you know so i'll try my best I'll, I'll really try my best. And generally just to say that, yes, we have discovered the COVID-19 has been a big turnaround for us. The world is no more flat. I mean, Thomas Friedman must be now writing a second book about how the world is topsy-turvy mm -hmm. already. Um, and we can see that, that that means the disruption is seen as a, we should see it positively. There, there are opportunities for all of us in all segments, not only just, we're not talking of personal spaces, but in the way we think as well. Uh, so I would encourage all of you to look at things ahead with a different mindset. And with that, uh, from team JSID and from you, Mother, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for having me and thank you for the wonderful questions. Okay. One last post. And the audience. Before you guys go, would you like to hear more about our postgraduate programs? Uh, please send that to us. If you have any more questions, of course, we about the program, we'll be happy to uh, get, get across to you. But let us know that. Uh, and please fill in this poll. We'd like to know what more would you be interested to know as soon as you finish this session, there'll be a survey for you. We would like you to fill it up. Let us know, let us connect more. And there will be more webinars coming up every week. Do be in touch with us and you will get to know the topics of the webinars very soon. So as soon as the poll six is done, we will wind up the session for today. Mother, what do you predict? How long are we locked in? <laughs> That's a good question. I think, um, look, I, I am preparing, I'm prepared to take whatever the government gives me in terms of easing up. I'm not too stressed because I think there's a lot of what we, how we are living right now is more or less going to continue for some time out of a sense of personal safety. I mean, I'm not really going to go out, eat, like crazy or go watch a movie mm -hmm. for some time now. Um, but you know what? I think, look, there is some hope in the future. People are talking about vaccine. If we can all achieve either through transmission or through vaccine, if the world can achieve 60% herd immunity, then it's gone. Then the virus is gone. The important thing is, will the lessons stay? Do we start suddenly enjoying open spaces, being more public, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, stop giving space over to cars, start keeping them for people and animals. Uh, can we start growing things at home? Can we start cooking ourselves, discovering our mother's recipes? Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot that we can stay, take forward in a positive way from this. And there will be, I'm very, very yeah. sure it's going to be. We'll watch, we'll watch the next uh, 10 days and then maybe if it gets extended the next 15 days after that. But Great. So, well, uh, be safe. Yeah, you too, Nian. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye, so all of you. Thank you.